recording. All right. All right, so the lesson is kind of spread out over the boards. But the main thing is uh, we have this lesson, and then when we come back from break, we're going to have two additional lessons. This lesson is spread over two days. Today we're just finding the inverses, finding the inverses along with the domain and range of the inverse and the original. Okay, they're, they're related in a way we can get to. It's not so bad. But first off, we have to see, is there an inverse? Is there an inverse? So an inverse is kind of, uh, we're going to get to it in a second. Just keep in mind that each, every single function has an inverse if we make the function in a certain form that we can deal with. Okay? To see if we can deal with a function and create an inverse from it, we look and see that, okay, we can test it with a horizontal line test. See if it's possible to get an inverse. So I look here. I make a horizontal line across, and if it intersects at one point, then I know it's a one-to-one -one function. There's one horizontal line intersecting with one place on the function. This is pretty straightforward. This is a linear equation. It's much easier to find the inverse for a linear equation than other types of functions. Okay? So, um, you know what? I don't have a linear equation up there. I'm just going to show it really quick. Really quick, I'm going to show you the process and then explain it as we go through it. Okay. So if I have a linear equation right here, and I'd say that that function is probably just x minus 2. Okay. What we're going to do to find the inverse, essentially the inverse is where the x value and the y values switch places. Instead of one being dependent and independent, now we switch places. Now the x is the dependent, the y is the independent. Okay. And that may not make sense with the vocab I just used. If it does, perfect. If not, this is how it works out. Here's the regular y is equal to x minus 2. If I'm finding the inverse, I switch the location of my x and my y. Now it becomes x, y minus 2. The independent variable became the dependent variable. The dependent variable became the independent variable. You just switch places and then solve for your new y and relabel it as your inverse. So. If I solve for my y, then add 2. I add 2. x plus 2 is equal to y. Since it's the inverse, we're going to use this notation that I'll reiterate in a second. That is the inverse for this function up here. Okay. So you can start to see some you know, connections here. One's minus, one's plus. But really, all you're doing to find it is switching the x and y, solving for your new y, relabeling it. This negative 1 here in the function notation is showing inverse. Okay. So you can see that when you have a one-to-one -one function that's a linear equation, it's pretty straightforward to find the inverse. Okay? This one, though, why is this not a one-to-one -one function? How many times does it intersect? Two. Two times. Anything more than one, it's not one-to-one. -one. If we had a really strange function that was a higher-order function like this, right? that is not... That is definitely not a one-to-one -one function. That would take a lot of chopping it up in order to find the inverse of this. Because you can chop up and restrict, you can crop the window of where you look at the function in order to make it one-to-one. -one. So I want you to tell your neighbor, where would I crop this in order to make it one-to-one -one where I could put a horizontal line at any place on the function and it would hit it once? Where do I need to crop this? What is my new domain restriction going to be? in order to make this possible for it to be a one-to-one. -one. So tell your neighbor, what do you think? How, how should I crop it so that I'll be able to make it one-to-one -one with the horizontal line test? Right now, it's twice. What do I restrict to make it hit once? Okay. Who is pretty sure? Uh, now, what do you think? Um, maybe the origin through the origin. You guys agree through the origin? Who else thought that at zero? At zero for x? Okay. So if you didn't think that, you're like, you're correct. Oh. If you did not think that, and you're like, well, maybe we just, you know, make it between negative 1 and infinity. Let's see what happens. So you're like, okay, well, I can just cut the function like that. You know, only look at this window from negative 1 on. But if I do a horizontal line test here, is it going to hit twice? Watch. Oh, no. That won't work. 
Okay, so I just heard some people talking about that. It's got to pass a horizontal line test at any level, at any level. So I like what you said there, Adnan. Instead, we're going to go ahead and do what? We're going to break it so that my domain restriction to start. My domain restriction, right, is going to be from zero to positive infinity, and it could include zero. So we restrict the domain in order to make the function be a one-to-one. -one. You see how it's one-to-one -one now? Okay. We're going to have to restrict the domain in this way. You could restrict it on the negative side, but we're going to restrict it on the positive side to, uh, for, uh, to be um, consistent. Yeah? If the vertex wasn't on zero, we could just do it from whatever the x value was? Mm -hmm. That's perfect. So, good question. If it was like this, right? To make this one to one, let's say that this vertex is at uh, one, three, right? Then I would say, well, I'm going to go ahead and cut it right here and go everything to the right. So, I'd say my domain in that case would be from one to positive infinity, okay? So, we just have to set it up. And essentially, what we're doing is we're, we're finding the domain restriction. That's going to be part of our answer when we're finding the domain and range of our original n inverse functions. But the first step is to see. Horizontal line test sees if you can have an inverse. It's pretty easy when it's linear, only intersects once, that's one to one. If it's not one to one, we got to restrict it. We got to restrict it either or from the vertex towards the positive direction. All right, good, okay. So only one to one functions have inverse, so you restrict the domain in order to make the function one to one if needed and then you find the inverse. Okay. Now comes the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of this. You guys teeth? Teeth? Did someone just say, what's teeth? <laughs> You're not in on it yet? Oh, he said teeth, teeth. He was just excited. Teeth. All right, teeth. Here we go. Function notation, everybody okay with this? f of x, that's just our function. We're going to note our inverse as f with this negative 1 of x. It's just showing the inverse of it. Um, it's related to, like, if you have x to the negative 1, you'd make it over 1. You basically take the function. It's, it's going to be an exact opposite configuration. You might also see this, y to the negative 1. Let's see that. We're not going to use that in general, but you might see it. And in order to find... Our inverse, we're also going to use our inverse properties. What's the opposite of addition? Opposite of multiply? Opposite of squaring it. The inverse of one fifth? Five over one. These are all these are all the opposites. That helps us because in order to solve for these, we have to we have to uh, um, isolate the new variable and do these options. All this right here, the functionality of how we find this is just like solving two-step equations. It's just solving for y every single time. Okay. So the what we do is not the trickiest part. Uh, I think it's the whole concept how it all works together is the trickiest part. So uh, this part is kind of new though. Whatever we find for our original domain and range, whatever they are, the inverse also inverts those values and those restrictions. So if you know your domain for the original, then you know the uh, domain is equivalent to the range of the inverse. So we're going to try to find these two values, and then we're going to flip them, and that's how they're going to match for the other, for the inverse. Basically, the inverse is like bizarre world. Everything is flipped. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see if we can do this. We'll do this one together, and we'll try those two. Uh, on our own, on your guys' own. All right, so first step, this is in function notation. Since I'm going to be changing around the x and y, I want to go ahead and just write it in um, our general form here. y is equal to x squared over 4. Okay. Step 1, that was kind of step 0. Step 1, switch where the x and the y are. Switch their actual positions. So it doesn't, if this was negative, I'm not moving the negative over. I'm not doing anything over like that, anything. I'm just going to say, well, now it's x is equal to y squared over 4. You see, it's a really basic thing we have to do. You take, put the x in the place of the y, the y in place of the x, 
And then that's how we're setting up to find the inverse. Now what do we have to do to find the inverse? Solve for that y value. This is the part you've already done. You've already done this, how to solve for a value. Okay. So y squared divided by 4. Instead of divide by 4, what should I do? Let's look at our inverse operations. Let's multiply by 4 on both sides. We have 4x is equal to y squared. And then, what's next? Square root. Square root. Okay, I'm getting to the y. I know I need to square root it. See so you, see you. So we have y on the right side. We'll, we'll label that as our inverse in a moment. So let's finish it over here. This is the square root of 4 times x. Which of these values can we square root? 4. What's the square root of 4? 2. What's left over on the inside? We couldn't get rid of the, the square root of x, so it leaves. Uh, it's left in there. Okay. Let's relabel it. F negative 1 of x is equal to 2 times root x. That is my inverse. It arrived here from the original, the original function, the inverse function. We got the notation right. It looks pretty good. And now we need to look and see, well, what, what kind of domain restrictions are we going to have? So we have the f of x. We have f negative 1 of x. You'll have to do this for, for each problem. So first off, I, I kind of made a little bit of a mistake here. What should I have done first? <clears throat> hmm. It's over on that side of the board. Is this one-to-one? -one? We can make it one-to-one. -one. What do you see here that makes this not one-to-one? -one? The exponent is squared, right? So that means that this this uh, this uh, you know is somewhere. Actually, it's at the origin, but it's going to be really close. It's going to be narrow. All right. So we first had to do our domain restriction here. We had to go in here, and if you can't see where that vertex is, I don't mind for this. You can graph this using Desmos. Find where that vertex is, and then you're going to restrict it in the positive direction. So since this function here has this approximate graph. I know that vertex is at zero, so I'm going to say, well, let's cut it and just go this direction. X is greater than or equal to zero. Has to be. That allows us to get rid of one of the sides and pass the vertical line test. So sorry I didn't do that first. But you know what's good? Because we know the domain of the original, what do we know about the range? of the inverse. What do we know? What do we know about these two values? They're going to be exactly the same. I'm just going to have to relabel it as y is greater than or equal to 0. Because the range is our y values, the domain is our x values, so I have to just be appropriate with labeling. Yeah. This is going OK right now. I'm going to try to get it together with these last two problems. Okay. Uh, then you look here and you see, well, what would the range option be? Okay, think about this one. The range. If I put in negative 4 up here, negative 4 squared is what? 16. Positive. Positive 16 divided by 4? 4. If I put in positive 4 here, what do I get? 16 divided by 4? 4. If I put in, you know, 100 or a negative 100, what is always going to happen when we square a positive or a negative number? It always becomes positive. If you got a negative 1,000, you square it, it ends up being positive. No? If you have negative 10, you square it. Remember, it's negative 10 times negative 10. Is there any way to end up with a positive number if you're squaring it? No, it's always going to be positive. Okay. So if that's the case, if we plug in any value for x, it always becomes positive. Would you imagine then that the y that we end up with, the dependent variable, will always be positive? Let's see. Negative 4, we, we square it, we get 16 divided by 4 is 4. We put in ne uh, negative 5, negative 5 squared is 25 divided by 4. It's always going to be positive. We put in a positive value there, put in 10. 10 squared, 100 divided by 4, 25. 
you see all the numbers we put in here because it's squared end up giving us positive values. So our y value here, our y will always be positive no matter what x value we put in there. Plus, we already know that x has to be greater than 0 in this case, so we know any positive number here is going to give us a positive value, so watch. y is greater than or equal to 0 as well, and then you know that one is also the same. Those are always the same. We have to do this three times. We have to see it. Like, I expect everyone to be right here right now. Right? Thumbs up sideways down. How we go? Yeah. yeah. And that's not on you. Uh, this order isn't quite refined because I added something. So let's, uh, let's, let's do our best with uh, example two and three. And these are not squared functions, so we won't have to restrict the domain to start. All right. Let's look at this function right here. All right, let's change it. All right, so I'm looking here, and I'm looking at the original function, right? We're going to have to put in, we're going to have to put in a domain restriction for the original function. I want you to tell you what values are not allowed right there in order to keep the answers real. Tell your neighbor, what values for x are we not allowed to have under the root? Because I could substitute any number in here. There's some numbers that will make this not work out. So what numbers are we not allowed to substitute in for x? Tell your neighbor. Okay. Not sure? So the question again. We're going to substitute some values in for x, but first we've got to say, see if there are any values that we can never substitute in here for x. What is something that we cannot have under the root? Negative numbers. We can't have negative numbers under the root. We have to be forced to use imaginary numbers to work with that, and we're keeping it real. So since in the original function, the x values, the domain, cannot be negative, I'm going to say x is greater than or equal to 0. That says an inequality, it would also be... Uh, zero to positive infinity as uh, interval notation. These are the same. This means the same exact thing. Guess what? You know this? You know that? And then let's follow this domain right here. If the domain is that we're only going to put x values in here that are positive or 0, right? Uh, let's see. What kind of answers are we always going to end up with? If I put a positive value in a square root, I end up with a positive. I add a positive number to it, I end up with a positive. So what is, what are my outputs, my y values? What, are, uh, what possible numbers are we going to have? from the domain restriction we have. What are we going to get for y? We're always going to end up with what? Tell your neighbor what you think. I feel it. You guys are a little missing part because I am not saying it clearly. Um, the way you can look at it, the way you can look at it, I know that I'm going to plug in x values from 0 all the way to positive infinity. What happens if I plug in 0? What happens if I plug in 0? 0 plus 1, 1. Right? So I know that my range is going to, I could end up with 1. Uh, if I plug in any other positive numbers, I could plug in 100. Square root of 100 is 10, plus 1 is 11. I could plug in 10,000. The square root of 10,000 is 100, plus 1 is 101. So it looks like we're starting from 1 for the range, and we go to positive infinity. So all you have to do is look here. You know the domain restriction because you can't have negatives under the root. So take whatever your lower limit is here. Plug it in. See what the range is going to be. The range is what values are included, what values are cropped. Okay. This is a higher concept than I thought. 1 plus... Maybe we do a couple more examples. 
Let's go ahead and solve this now. We have it in function notation. Let's switch where the x and the y are to get it into our inverse. Solve for y. It's OK if this is kind of mechanical right now. So if you're confused about this part, it's nothing new. This is the hardest part, domain and restrictions and range. But this part is just switching the x and y and solving for y. So I want you to at least get half the problem right to start. And if you have trouble on this with the homework, we're going to look at it again tomorrow. So maybe when we get the full graphing in there, it'll be easier to see. It's hard to explain, so I know it's hard to understand. Okay. So, solve for y. Minus 1, minus 1. How do you get rid of the square root? What's the inverse of the square root? Square root. <laughs> there we go. So then we'll just relabel it f negative 1 of x. x minus 1 squared. That is my inverse from my original. Question? If we just, we, it would be setting it up because this is x minus 1 squared. It's x minus 1 times x minus 1. So that would be foiling it into a trinomial, and you will not have to do that. We're going to keep it in essentially closest to vertex form as we can, because when we graph tomorrow, you want it to be in vertex form. I hope this is OK to see where you know, this graph right here. Where's the vertex? What's my h? Positive 1. What's my k? 0. Remember this? Vertex form. x minus h plus k. x minus h squared plus k. Vertex is at 1, 0. Okay. So we're going to keep it in this form so we can graph it. Mm. Oof. I feel it. It's all here still. It's here. I can feel it. It's here, right? Yeah. All right. Sorry about this. <laughs> I tried to break it into two days because it's a lot here, and then you had graphing on top of it. It's a lot. The graphing is going to affirm and confirm some things that we're learning right now because you'll see it. Okay. So keep that in mind. Let's let's work on this one. Let's work on this one. I might do another. All right. Okay. Who can uh, candy crux? I don't have much candy, so I'll give you Starburst. Uh, Starburst crux. What's the? Not just. I think there's one. What's a really good? What's a really good reason or the hardest part about this? Please. Hardest part. Do you know where to start? Oh no! It's that bad. It's not your fault. This is hard to teach. I'm, I wanna, I'll, I'll adapt my teaching. Margaret. Remembering that when you switch the x and y, you don't have the same thing as Okay. It's just the x moves to just where the y is. Just where the y. Yeah, that's good. This will be an IOU candy crux. Anybody else have a, a crux? The hardest part? Is it all this? Yeah. Who thinks it's this? Yeah. Oh, God, that's everybody. Okay, how about this? Today, tonight, we're going to practice doing this process, finding the, the um, excuse me, finding the inverse. Uh, tomorrow, with the graphing, we'll hit this one more time, and that'll be covered tomorrow. I think with the graphing, it'll help because you'll see how we're cutting things up. Okay, because if you graph them, and I'll let you use some Desmos for that, you can see where it starts and stops. You're just cropping it to what we can, what we. Uh, what we need to make the function work. But I do want you to notice this, if it's one-to-one -one or if it's not one-to-one. -one. So maybe you have to use a little bit of Desmos as well to plug in the formula. If you, if you can't see it, like if it's linear, you know it's one-to-one. -one. But if it's like this, I do want you to think about how you would restrict the domain to make it one-to-one. -one. So you have restricted to be one-to-one. -one. Go ahead and do this process. We'll leave domain and range. We'll hit it again tomorrow and build that up. Okay. Question? If it's not a one-to-one function, -one function, what ends up happening is these will not be able to coincide. 
Um, if it's not one to one, you technically cannot take the inverse because the domain and range wouldn't align in the same way that they have to when it's an inverse. So the main thing is that this part here, that's the hardest part. If it's not one-to-one, -one, this will not be able to be worked out. This will be impossible. We have to make it one-to-one -one and then deal with this. Since this part is what we're going to deal with tomorrow, if you figure out where you have to cut it so it doesn't intersect it twice, where it only intersects it once, so cut it at the vertex, that's going to be key information for tomorrow. So I want you to see, when you have a quadratic, a parabola, where do you cut it? Cut it at the vertex, find the vertex, and then just say it's everything to the positive direction from there. Okay, so that's not a very full explanation. Oof. I'm sorry. I'll add to it tomorrow. Okay. Let's do this one. This is what I want you to practice. Go ahead and switch them. Find your inverse. I hope this part doesn't doesn't uh, scare you too much. I hope it does. It does too. Don't be scared. Look, there's the y. Guess what that becomes? That becomes the x. Same thing. Everything else is the same. Essentially, I could have said this. That's where my two variables are, right? What's going to go here instead? The x. What's going to go here instead? The y. Literally, pick them up. Like, you can get a little exacto knife and cut out the x, cut out the y, and put them in the opposite place and tape it. Like, that is all you move. You don't move any negatives that are connected to it. It's just the x, just the y. What comments? What? What? <laughs> All right. Uh, divide by two instead of divide by two. Thank you. Two x is equal to the square root of negative y. Instead of square rooting it, square it. Two x squared is two x times two x. What's two times two? What's x times x? There we go. You could also multiply by a negative one. It wouldn't make any difference. You're applying a negative to both sides, essentially. So you're going to end up with negative four x squared is equal to a negative one. Hope that isn't so bad. What part of that is bad? I think it's all this other information that's like tired your brain out. Where this part is actually just solving it for the variable, which you've done math one and now two for quite a bit. Okay. So what else is hard? What else is hard? Okay. What do you think, Adna? What's hard? All this stuff from here over? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll work on it. I'll think of different ways I can teach it tomorrow. I like a challenge. This may be a little more challenging than I expected, but that means it's on me. A lot of teachers put it on you. That's not interesting to me. All right. Any other input? What's hard? It'll help me for tomorrow? Nothing. All right. Is it just the basic remembering what domain and range are? Yes. Remember we talked a lot cropping it, cropping it, what's included? Yeah. I see. I always look at it and think about it as these operations are really connected to x and they're connected right here by square root. This whole thing is connected here by division. So I think about it as 
You're working the way from the outside in. You're working from the outside in. If this if this is divided by two, it's this entire thing divided by two. So it wouldn't be logical to say, well, first I want to go inside the root and get rid of that negative. You always work from the outside in. So if you have a really complex function up here, you still want to get to the variable. You divide by two first, excuse me, times by two first to get rid of the twos. And then I look here. I can't get to the negative without dealing with the root. So then I'm working out the root. Then I get down here. I need to get rid of the negative. And now I finally have my answer. So it's working from the outside in. If anything is ever on the bottom of a fraction, get rid of that first. And then work your way through. And I see like this is something that we'll have to, we'll have to hit in different ways tomorrow. Okay. All right, give it to me. Thumbs up, sideways down. Be truthful. Give me this if it's there. Anybody? All right, so we're about 50% here and dipping. Okay. But it's okay. How about this? Thumbs up, sideways down for... Just solving for a variable. Okay, okay. So tonight's homework is doable. It's just tomorrow we got to focus on one to one again and the domain and range. That's not bad. Okay. Maybe that fit better with the second day with graphing and it's just a misplacement. Okay. So just keep that in mind, guys. Uh, we do our best. We adapt. Don't flinch. All right, guys.